So, as I mentioned, we've had a very busy morning, and now it gives us an opportunity to go uh, deeper into a couple of our portfolios. And so we appreciate you attending uh, on the panel with me, our two win, who is the head of our equity and fixed income business here at Vena Capital. And to her left is Fung Nguyen. Uh, Fung, for the purpose of the offshore investors, uh, manages VAF, uh, which is our Cayman feeder fund, a daily, excuse me, monthly liquid that buys our local fund, uh, VSAF. And I, I do see some familiar faces from the local market. So she also manages VSAF, which is our local uh, Vietnamese portfolio. So uh, let's just dive right into it. We'll save some time for Q&A as well. Uh, Fung, I, I will say this as a colleague and also as a shareholder, uh, congratulations on your performance. Uh, we noted that your cash level uh, and conservative positioning is contributing factors to your performance, particularly in 2022. Uh, are these likely to change in the next 12 to 18 months? Um, so I would like to recall some of the situation in, 20, uh, in the first nine months. So actually when um, you know, in 2021, the market was very hot. And at the beginning of the year, because this one, VAF, focused more on the small mid cap. And when we look at the universe, we saw that a lot of the small cap, especially small caps, um, they had a very unreasonable valuations. So at that time, we think the market is kind of, uh, has some kind of risk. And um, then at the same time, we see it the the change in the corp, uh, corporate bonds regulation actually will impact the liquidity of the market a lot so uh, at that time we reduce the uh the exposure to banks and brokerage uh to the lowest we can uh to save the the um the, to, to reduce the risk of the portfolio. So going to this year, um, the market actually re declined 30% uh, year to date. Uh, so we think that all the risk, uh, that risk, rose risk was priced in. But uh, actually right now we face with another risk that the, the interest rate in Vietnam actually increased uh, um, faster than we expected. So that's why we think um, uh, some headwinds to remain. Um, and that, uh, so, so the major concern of my uh, in my portfolio is the earnings uncertainty. So I think, um, especially for the banks and the real estate, we think that's to some of the downside. So how the market will be like perceive the derating in valuations as long uh, as well as the uh, deterioration in the B uh, B book and also the e EPS of the, these companies. So that's why we think uh, I would stay a kind kind of conservative, still low weight in banks. Uh, but then I will plan to have a much more uh, concentrated portfolio on resilient companies because I think uh, when the market went down a lot, there certainly will be very strong recovery, but it will be very dis um, like dispersion in performance, especially in small mid caps. Please. In, 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 I, I probably should have done this uh, in the beginning. So in, in 2021, uh, Fung's domestic fund, VSAF, led the market in Vietnam up over 66%. And so the fact that she's been able to then transition that uh, very deftly, and so still outperforming this year uh, by over 10%. So oftentimes you can find managers that, in a sense, outperform only by taking risk. Uh, and she and the team have been able to not only outperform on the upside, but also now on the downside. So, so two, from a VVF perspective, and again, VVF is our, our, our daily listed uh, usage fund, how do you think about your positioning along the same lines? It's mm. one team, but slightly different mandates. Right, yeah. Uh, we, we, we discussed a lot. I mean, during this year, as uh, the headwinds emerge and we discussed on, on macro, we found that this is an environment uh, to not take too much risk. So we do risk at the beginning of the year raising cash, uh, taking profit from companies that did well last year, as well as at the beginning of the year. So the cash position went from 4% to 17%. As you can see, notably, the real estate and financial sector went down in terms of weight. Uh, real estate went from 12% to just about 2%. Uh, what we increased was the sectors that are more defensive and resilient in this market, and they include uh, the uh, consumer discretionary, uh, more because of the expected recovery in retail sales uh, after half a year of uh, COVID lockdown last year. Uh, and also industrials. Industrials here actually refer to uh, a group of stocks in industrial parks that continue to do well because uh, our FDI disbursement uh, is, uh, remains healthy this year, uh, as well as during the COVID time. Uh, the ports and logistics companies uh, are, also ex uh, are also enjoying a good growth in terms of throughput uh, because Vietnam remains uh, a big ex exporter in the world. Um, 
and uh, information technology remains the same. It's pretty much one company. Materials, we, we did take profit in materials uh, before, the, uh, before those stocks uh, actually collapsed. So, so that's a good thing. We still keep a core holding in materials because we believe in the longer term uh, prospect of these stocks. So I'll add a comment here because one of, the, one of the things that we talk about is our research process. We talk about our, our, our buys and our active weights. But I think you know, where the team also deserves a lot of credit is in a sense for not owning certain things. And so whether it's a cash position or whether it's just looking at index weights and deciding, you know what, I don't like it, we're going to have a zero weight because that's oftentimes what's driving performance as well. So Fung, you know, you talk about having a low banking weight uh, and you talked about the concerns are, as you look at bank stocks, you know, think about increasing it. What, what, given the valuation, what would it take for you to, to add to a banking stocks? And are there things that you're looking at already and are you waiting for a catalyst or are you just waiting for overall sentiment to turn around? Yeah, so um, in the last two years, it was a very uh, favorable market condition or uh, macro environment for the banks. So the banks in our coverage uh, saw um, the increase in the NIM uh, due to the strong uh, uh, credit demand, uh, even during the pandemic. Um, they also have pushed the uh, fee income. Uh, at the same time, the asset quality of the banks is very good, uh, while they keep increasing the uh, um, reserve cover. Uh, so I think the, the banks were very good in, uh, in the last year. So for this year, we actually um, think that um, after the bank's correction, the, the share price correction from around P book of one and uh, two point six times for the whole, uh, now they just gone to one point five. But actually, from our coverage, focus on the um, the private banks, the P book actually just one times. So we think that it's very attractive. Uh, so ma the major concern for the banks right now is whether the rising interest rate environment will impact further impact the profitability, how can they defend the name, and, and more important, uh, how does the asset quality will be deteriorated uh, based on at, in the current market condition, like very tightening in both credit and the bond. Um, so that's why we, we come up here uh, to show you how we look at banks. So these are the names that VAF used to invest in in the last three years. So we will adjust it differently in different market conditions. For example, uh, in 2020, when we faced with COVID, we actually overweight uh, top holdings in ACB, the fifth bank. So um, this bank actually have a very strong uh, uh, like risk management practice. They are kind of very conservative banks in or among the Vietnamese banks. In uh, 2021, uh, we are in end of 2020 and 2021, we actually bought uh, the, some the names in the, in the top. So they exhibit both uh, growth uh, and also the, um, like strong because they, they got very good product strategy, uh, customer acquisition, uh, and at the same time, some of very large exposure to real estate also to capture the strong demand of the market. But 2023 going forward, we may look at reassess and then we may, we think that can you, to next slide. We think that um, at this time we favor banks that uh, exhibit all. So you see, I think um, from this, uh, from next year going forward, the market was very tough because banks have to compete to high quality uh, retail invest, uh, like retail customers, and also the mortgage uh, people need for the mortgage. So they have to fight a lot. So the banks were very. Um, a strong strategy. They actually acquired a lot of customer during the last two years. So this, so this time they will continue to shy. Um, and at the same time, the risk management is, is, is ha has to be taken in consideration. So, uh, so um, uh, for, for for that ranking, I think the the top two uh, like MB and S MBB and STB were our topic for the for the next year. Thank you. And so earlier, you, you mentioned real estate briefly. I'll, I'll, I'll turn this to two. So two, historically, you've actually had a big underweight in real estate. And, and you know, I, I joke when I meet with certainly the, the, the local investors, everybody in Vietnam, his first investment is real estate, their second investment is real estate, and, and then we hopefully can convince them to buy a mutual fund, which is their third investment is bank insurance. So it's, it's we're really not even fourth. And so as you think about real estate, um, what would need to change for you to become more bullish you know, urbanization is such a huge trend in Vietnam. It's a theme for Vienna Capital. I don't want to say there's a disconnect, but how can we be so excited about a theme and yet so underweight in a sector? 
Yeah, so this is our weight in real estate uh, compared to the uh, index itself. So we've always underweighted compared to the index, but this year we've reduced the weight even further. And the reason for that is why we're excited about the urbanization theme, but investing in a stock is different than you know, liking a company or liking the product. Um, it, it involves so many things and we are bottom-up investors, which means that sometimes uh, we do not have to be in real estate. Um, and uh, it, I mean, the uh, real estate everywhere is probably the same, but in Vietnam even more, uh, they are even more difficult to analyze. Now, with, with that, there, there's something, it's the third bullet, it says corporate bond market decrease 65. It was just mentioned earlier the, the, in, in Andy's session. And by the way, that has to do with corporate bond issuance. So maybe just spend a minute on that in terms of the impact and the relationship between banks and real estate and how that was intertwined. Yeah, I was going to say that the real okay. estate sector is basically you know, both capital intensive as well as higher risk of corporate governance as well as uh, financing risk uh, and, and, and uh, policy risk. So we've, we've seen recently that there's been change in policies regarding the real estate. Uh, there's been tightening in the bank lending as well as the bond market that affects the real estate sector very uh, negatively. And, and the decree 65 is one of the things that have had you know, the impact. Uh, well, it's the revision of the yeah. decree 153, which is, uh, revolves around the requirements for issuing a bond by the developer and the sale of the bond uh, to you know, the end investors. Right. And so this decree, you know, oftentimes it's not the rule, it's uncertainty around what the rule will be. And so Decree 65 just came out a week ago. And so uh, it's not perfect, but I think at least sets the stage for people to exactly know if they're gonna issue a bond, what they can use it for. So does that, does that make real estate a bit more attractive or at least just more clear? I think at the moment, uh, I think there are some bank representatives in the room. So uh, uh, I think they, we, we probably know that there is currently not enough clarity yet from the uh, perspective of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, issue, the issuers as well as the brokers, uh, people who help the issuers you know, reach the end investors. And therefore, it will take a while for this to get more clarity. Uh, so for the time being, it's still going to be you know, an overhang on the bond market. And uh, I'm also in charge of the fixed income team, and we are having, we're still having issues you know, finding new uh, bond issuance to buy for a growing uh, fixed income fund. When she says issue, she means she manages the number one performing bond fund. That's what she meant to say, <laughs> which is true. Um, all right, so quick question. So we, we had an FDI panel this morning, which I thought was pretty cool. Having said that, FDI isn't just, in a sense, it stands for foreign direct investment, but it's actually a theme from within your portfolio. So you talk about having exposure to F FDI, and I remember when I joined, I said, how can you do that? Isn't, doesn't FDI mean foreign companies? So uh, given companies under the theme might be impacted by potential global recession, uh, stronger dollar, uh, how do you think about adjusting the exposure and maybe even spend a minute on what FDI means to you as an investor? Because when I hear FDI, the first word is foreign and I get confused on how you can take advantage of that as well. Yeah, um, so um, Vietnam's uh, growth is based on the two pillars, right? Uh, both domestic consumption and the FDI coming into Vietnam. And then the listed, well, for the listed equities, actually we'll find opportunities in uh, industrial parks, uh, logistics, utilities, and every like uh, supporting service that, that can grow with that story. And then, um, um, so when uh, we recall that uh, in the last two years, the export growth was around 20%. Uh, our research team view was that um, um, uh, this year, maybe um, next year, it will be kind of slower due to the slow, slower global demand. But actually we still grow because we uh, attract uh, like relocation of the factory from China. We have uh, higher value uh, products, uh, production in Vietnam, and also good stability in both uh, uh, political and um, currency, so we we still think that is a is a story um, like a valid story, uh, but for the companies within in the portfolio, we saw that uh, 
we may have some of the minor adjustment into, uh, into the, the names that we want to hold. For example, in the direct exporters, actually we have some of the fishery companies. Um, we think they, they still shine during the, the difficult condition. When you think, when you see that a lot of uh, furniture companies, textile companies face the slow in orders and then um, build up inventory. But for fishery, it's, it's not the story. So they still perform well. Um, besides, we have logistics uh, utilities. We think they are more resilient than others. They are kind of defensive. Um, we, we, we have a look at and maybe trim down some, but not much. Uh, we have industrial parks here, and this is one of the, our pick, a, a small cap uh, universe. So this one is very small. You can see the total land bank they announced is lower than peers. But this year, actually, we want to I was going to say, define what you mean by small cap, because it's a little bit different here than in most markets. Okay, so because of the offshore fund, we um, define the small cap with the market caps uh, lower than 500 million. And this one is uh, around 200 million market capitalization at the moment. Um, yeah, so uh, this year we may emphasize the, um, uh, the certainty in the, the ability to turn the asset into the earnings. Uh, by um, so for example this company they have a high um, percentage of land banks already for lease because uh, i think uh, uh, the export is not the, the um, like the factors that impact this company but actually the, the land approval process in vietnam even industrial so that's that's how we think that this uh, this pick uh, will will survive well in this environment they have land to lease they got no more funding uh, issues because they have already have the asset here. Um, so um, this land piece already lo locates in a very um, potential uh, location. Uh, and the Barrier Vũng Tàu, actually in the west, the southwest of the country, it has currently has a very low occupancy rate compared to other major production hub. Um, so the land rental actually went, uh, like increasing gradually. So that's how we can uh, export uh, this uh, plan. So, yeah. so uh, understanding that, you know, defensively, domestic consumption will be attractive. You know, one of the things that we've talked about historically is this, this theme, and it makes sense because it's more defensive sometimes, also has higher valuations. And so how do you think about, you know, we're in a growth market that tends to be, still be cheaper. How do you think about weighing growth versus valuation? And is it company specific? Do you have a target? You know, is it company specific? You know, how do you think about that? Yeah. Um I I I um I used to crash, uh, scratch my head when it comes to pick the consumer place. Um, uh, so for if we look at the VN index, the consumers actually uh, the the real consumers uh, they characterize is um, are the retailings and F and B companies, and they actually have a have, have a very high valuation compared to the small mid caps I usually invested in, and but recently. Uh, with the market cor deep correction, we think that the retail companies uh, become more attractive uh, at around 12 times PE for the next year. And our research analysts actually um, did the uh, sensitivity analysis on these companies, and we see that the, their earnings actually were more resilient and had minimal impact, uh, was minimally impacted by the macro environment at the moment. So maybe that's a good uh, to consider. And one thing, and you know, we talk, you know, when we talk about macro and we talk about the market, um, I think it's important. I know I mentioned this earlier. You know, we're an active investor, so if people are familiar with the share active active share. The statistic, uh, VAF has an active share of around 82 right now, which is probably a little little bit higher than normal, but still very high. And VVF at 70 percent. And so again, you know, the, the old cliche from one of the previous firms that I worked for was, you know, in order to beat the market, you have to be different than the market. And, and for those of us, particularly in a volatile time. You know, we're not looking to replicate the index. We understand that people will measure us uh, against the index or a benchmark, but the reality is, you know, we're going to buy what we like and we'll, we'll, we'll buy it in conviction. So for that, I want to add, uh, so that's the, these are the real consumer plays, but we are, actually we have others. Uh, so research view is that um, 
this year the domestic consumption will be drive, driven by the uh, uh, recovery in international tourism and also the public spending. Uh, these are factors are actually did not happen in the in this year, but the next year hopefully they will happen. And then we in a small mid cap space actually we have a lot of companies in the uh, aviation sector, um, aviation service sector, or as well as the materials that can go with that team in this year. And, and so, too, you know, within VVF, you've had actually an overweight in consumer discretionary, but an underweight in staples. You know, do you think that relationship will will increase? Will it be, will it be different? And, and where do you think of, particularly now with the big cash position, where do you think about if that cash position comes down, where do you think about deploying that? Uh, and that might be in 2023, right. not in the next month. Yeah, we, we are seeing two pockets of opportunities uh, at the moment. Uh, one is uh, on in the oversold stocks. The very good fundamental stocks um, that still have you know, solid fundamentals to go on and achieve their long-term growth objectives, but for the time being have been beaten down by the market. And we know what we're talking about here, uh, because I think just now uh, in the VOF session, we've also mentioned Huafat, but Huafat is a good company in, uh, in, in, in materials. Uh, it has a, a large, it's a large cap with market cap of 5 billion, but the PB at the moment is just one time, and it's one of those lowest time in the last, I mean, this one is probably 13 years. Uh, so it's the valuation is one of those lowest time in the last 13 years. BE is also at five times, so it's, it's so cheap that we think, although there may still be some downside, but uh, I think it, it can't go further wrong from here. Uh, Nam Long is also a real estate developer, and I mean, we, we have only 2.5% weight in the real estate sector and is in this stock. Uh, we, I think we did well. We, we also took some profit in the sector previously, but this is a stock which we are willing to top up, to, to re-enter, to, you know. You know the management end. team, the yes. fundamentals haven't changed much and it's yeah. just gotten crushed. It's probably one of the very few real estate companies with a uh, price to book of less than one times uh, and a P uh, which is also very attractive at less than 10 times. The other pocket of opportunities is in the resilient companies. Uh, for this environment, as I mentioned in this morning, uh, we might, you know, put resiliency as a top priority over growth. I mean, long-term growth is still a focus, but for the time being, we focus on resilient companies. And these are some of the examples. Uh, Jemadep is a leading ports and logistics company uh, with, it's, you know, the largest deep sea port in Vietnam. And, you know, we are a very open economy, 200% uh, trade versus GDP. Uh, and the company, so the company has a, a lot of good long-term catalysts. But if we look at the resiliency, basically the net income growth CAGR for this period is very attractive. The PE is, is quite compelling. And uh, also, you know, in terms of the throughput uh, growth is almost 15%. But what's important is that for this type of business, which might be capital intensive, uh, it actually has very low net debt to equity of just 16%. And, and for, in, uh, for reference to markets, net debt to equity is 40%. Uh, p j is another company which we find to have good resiliency in this market. It did enjoy a good spurt of growth, uh, I mean, last year, and, uh, sorry, this year, particularly because of the return or the recovery of domestic- Your revenge consumption. spending. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, as, if, if, you, if you look at the market share, it's very attractive. Uh, this, the store expansion is attractive and the, uh, same store sales growth is expected to be sustainable at this 12% uh, level. And for those of you that, that uh, obviously are not from Vietnam, PNJ is uh, really a homegrown brand. It is the domestic uh, leading uh, jewelry company. And, it, and, it, and it's really, it's one of those where it, it's, it's not, uh, well, it's very aspirational for, for the Vietnamese consumer. And so as the emerging middle class grows, PNJ is a... If I could take another Good. half a minute, uh, this is we our portfolio. Left, so you can this is our portfolio, and the way we structure it is that around the three buckets: uh, core, cyclical, and opportunistic. As you can see, we've re reduced cyclical, we've reduced opportunistic to give way to core because core is more resilient, it's more defensive. Uh, core refers to companies which we are willing willing to hold for the long term. We might take profits or even exit a stock temporarily due to market headwinds and whatnot, but we always come back. So these are the companies that have high cash flow genera uh, generating abilities, low gearing and resilient business model. So as well. if the Fed does pivot, do you think the opportunistic bucket grows a bit? 
Uh, at the moment, I think we, we are looking at opportunistic from the angle of, you know, M&A catalyst or strategic deal or spin-off. And we, we don't find a lot of those opportunities in the market, but I think those will probably fall into cyclical. Real estate is actually in cyclical. So, uh, yeah, if the monetary policy changes, uh, definitely will benefit real estate, for instance. Now, I'm getting the three minutes signed, although after this is a break, so we can probably go a couple minutes a couple minutes later. But I do want to see if there's any questions from the audience. I know we, we're not done yet, but we, we might be done. So are there are there any questions from the audience? Yes, thanks. Uh, a lot of managers in, uh, in Europe and in the U.S. don't want to touch banks. They say, we don't understand what these guys do. It's very secretive. Uh, it can be very dangerous. Uh, are you comfortable with uh, the current, uh, I would say, uh, good uh, governmental rules, uh, supervision of banks, and what is uh, currently the level of, uh, of tier one capital of the, the, the Vietnamese banks? Are they capitalized enough? Because we have a lot of them, which is surprising for us. A lot of countries they have, they have merged. So what, what, what are your views there? Uh, so for Capitalization is one of the factors that we uh, we care in our bank's assessment. So um, among the uh, actually among the the six banks, for example, as a basket, you see that um, we have the two banks that have a very high car ratio, capital adequacy ratio, um, through their share issuance in the past few years, uh, or the return a very high return on on the, the asset. So we have those uh, banks. For the other banks, like in our holdings, for example, MBB, the top bank, uh, the capital adequacy is not that high, but they um, but. Talking about the risk management um, side, they had a very large uh, reserve cover. So you heard about VCB, the leading banks that have around 500 percentage um, on that. Uh, we have uh, the MBB here have around 300 uh, percent in the reserve cover ratio. Yeah, but in, in terms of uh, bank capitalization, I think at the moment because we are still uh, approaching Basel II standards yes. and. In meeting that, the banks would have to raise capital. Yes. Uh, but it's still some timeline so is away. Uh, yeah, I think the the, the banks, some of the banks uh, have actually completed, you know, complying with Basel II standards. But uh, as the industry as a whole, there are still banks that lag behind. Uh, but if we look at the whole sector, I think there is some uh, capital to be raised. But at the same time, those usually fall into the weaker banks. And uh, I think foreign investors usually expect that the State Bank of Vietnam would allow for the foreign ownership limits to be lifted in those weak banks to allow the foreign banks to come in and help develop the banking system. In terms of the number of banks, I just heard, uh, I think last night, that in either Indonesia or Philippines, there are like 200 banks, right? So it's a lot bigger number than, than Vietnam. Uh, but in any case, I think that uh, VAF has about 13% in banks and VVF has 20% in banks. So we are significantly underweight the sector. And we only focus on the very strong, you know, asset quality banks, the banks that are well managed. We, we, we do expect consolidation at some point. And, and one thing that just came out, um, or at least is very much rumored too, you can comment on this, is that there's four banks that will be given additional credit uh, quota and they'll be allowed to get additional credit quota by absorbing uh, a few of the kind of zero dong or underperforming banks. And so uh, the SBV is doing, I think, a very good job of saying, okay, if you want to grow, we'll, we'll give you this, you have to take on that. And, and so, is that accurate? Yeah, that's okay. a question. Of yes, sir. Uh, yeah, just back to the banks, please. Um, the government sets growth, loan growth uh, limits. How do the individual banks manage that in terms of what where they choose to grow their portfolios obviously that could be above or below the the set limit the framework and how yeah does that affect your choice of uh, selection the, the 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 banks are given uh, limits individually based on their own merits so the state bank have a set of criteria they score the individual banks against and based on that set of score, the, the, each of the bank is given a you know, set quota. But this quota is not given all in one go. Every year the, the quota is deliberated by the central bank and then given out in, in a few batches. So this year there's been two but, batches. But, but it's growth. about, do we assess who they're lending to? Not, not the actual quota itself, but are they doing commercial? Choose to, if the limit's 15%, they're going to ramp up their mortgages to 30% and pull back on their unsecured. 
I, I think the, the, each of the bank has their own strategy. Now, uh, most of the banks in Vietnam are pursuing the strategy of increasing the retail loan book because that's more uh, attractive, that's more uh, profitable for them. And so I think when this uh, new batch of quota was just recently given, we, we heard that most of the banks already have uh, a long list of, of customers uh, applying for these new loans. And therefore the banks usually, uh, at the moment the, the state bank is quite prudent. So the loan growth quota that they give out to the individual banks usually is lower than what the banks can actually absorb. So actually it's good for the banks to pick and choose the customers. So they would go for the you know, best credit rating customers. Uh, in, so over time, I think uh, as this process is managed prudently, uh, this will help to improve the uh, credit quality of the entire system. Just very briefly, um, is it all, do you, again, we can look at the sector, it's how the folks, sometimes the folks understand it, it's financial, but you're playing consumer through the financial. Because if somebody's, P&J is very limited retail names to buy, but if people are consuming more with Momo at the wet market, well, it's the only way is through a bank to capture that. So how do you, again, are you looking to capture the retail consumer opportunity through your financial weighting? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, when uh, we have our different investment themes, uh, it's actually all interlinked. We have our domestic consumption theme, our digitalization theme, uh, and our urbanization theme. And the banks is central in all of these themes. You know, with urbanization, meaning more people need to have a bank account, move to the cities and so on. And, and domestic consumption, as you rightly pointed out, more and more people are consuming digitally. So um, as I shared this morning, the, the MB, for instance, that we visited recently have a huge um, workforce in IT because they want to transform the bank into a more or less dig digital bank. Um, and so, yes, I think you're right in the sense that eventually uh, we'll be able to capture this domestic consumption boom within the financial sector. Mm. So actually five over six banks listed here focus more on the retail segment. So that's why we choose them um, in the previous years. Um, and I think that um, those banks would, because the acqu customer acquisition is a long process, right? So. Um, uh, two among the six one uh, were actually very successful and take market, took ma more market share from the other banks. So that, that's why we buy in the story in the uh, future success of these banks more. But, but, it is, but it is a very interesting point in terms from a, from a niche perspective or target market. There are certain banks that focus more wholesale or commercial, certain banks that are much more retail. And so that's where we've, we've focused. It's obviously, given the market, it's been a, the better place to be. So it's not always just about the credit growth. It's really about kind of who your who your segment is to begin with. Okay. Uh, any uh, one? We have time for one more question. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, Fung and Tu, thank you so much. <laughs>